On April 20, 2024, a Michigan woman, Marcella Chidester, age 66, left her home at approximately 2.57 p.m. Immediately after exiting her driveway, she backed into the front end of her neighbor's truck and sped away. Presumably fleeing the scene of this accident, she drove another 500 feet, heading in the direction of the Swan Boat Club, where she had been a member and commodore over 20 years. But, as she approached the parking lot at a high rate of speed without braking, her vehicle plowed into the pavilion side of the building, where a child's birthday party was being held. Her vehicle, a 2017 Ford Edge, plunged into the venue, hitting a wall 25 feet into the building, killing two small children and injuring 15 others. It is unclear if she intended to attend the party, as she gave conflicting accounts, when questioned by law enforcement officers. She now faces two life sentences. Although many victims were devastated by this tragedy, one family that was so deeply impacted was that of Mariah Dodds and her young children. Not only was she critically injured, sustaining trauma that rendered her comatose for three to four days, according to testimony, but her eldest son, and only surviving child, age 12, barely recovered. Worse still, her two youngest children, Alana, eight, and Zane, four, perished on the scene. Alana and Zane died from multiple blunt force injuries, according to medical reports. After the crash, Zane was pinned between the front driver's side tire and the wall where the vehicle stopped. Party attendees sprang into action to lift the car to take him out of the pavilion. He was laid on a grassy area outside, awaiting emergency medical services. During the probable cause hearing, Sergeant Michael Bomia testified to observing a small child lying on the grass with other victims needing medical care when he arrived. Sergeant Bomia stated that the child was unresponsive and did not appear to be breathing or moving. Alana was eventually found on the front passenger side, near the tires pinned up against the wall or door frame of the pavilion, going into the walkway. J.D., the eldest and only surviving child of the family, suffered a fractured skull and multiple broken bones, including his legs, ribs, and pelvis, among other injuries. As of this recording, he is still unable to walk. The mother, Mariah, was found in the breezeway and was pulled from underneath a door going into the pavilion that had come off the hinges, according to testimony. She was left in a coma with fractured ribs, a collapsed lung, a missing tooth and other mouth injuries, a chin cut, torn lips that had to be sewn back together, a hematoma, a broken shoulder blade, and a concussion. Marcella Chidester was arrested on the scene and later charged with two counts of second-degree murder, two counts of operating while intoxicated causing death, and four counts of operating while intoxicated causing injury. She was sued by the children's father. To date, the case was dissolved and consolidated with the civil suits of other injured victims. In addition to Mrs. Chidester, Vernus Tavern and the Swan Boat Club were named in lawsuit. To date, there are no scheduled hearings in the civil matter, according to court documents. The criminal case remains open in the 38th Circuit Court of Monroe County, Michigan, where she was bound over to stand trial by a district court judge. She has been arraigned and is scheduled for a pretrial hearing in August. Defending Marcella Chidester is a Michigan local attorney, Bill Kolovos, of the Kolovos Law Firm in Garden City. He, reportedly, has 39 years legal experience and specializes in OUI and DUI cases. Mr. Kolovos is a criminal attorney. He also practices in the areas of personal injury, property damage, family, and probate law. He is also a participating member in the Criminal Law Section of the Michigan Bar Association and the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. Kolovos ran for public office in 2020 for a seat in the Michigan House of Representatives. Marcella Chidester was taken into custody at the crash site on 04-20-2024 and arraigned in district court on 04-23-2024 in Monroe County. She posted a $1.5 million non-monetary surety bond and was released according to court records. A probable cause hearing was held on 06-27-24 where she was bound over to circuit court to stand trial. She was arraigned on 07-12-2024 and a pre-trial hearing was scheduled on 08-23-2024, 20, 
pursuant to the request of the defense due to voluminous discovery and for time to review and retain experts. Marcella Chittister remains free as her bond was continued with conditions including home confinement monitored by GPS tether. She must abstain from alcohol and other illicit drugs and submit to regular substance testing and monitoring. She must also notify the court of any change in address, phone, or other contact information and surrender her passport. Mrs. Chittister is prohibited from driving, leaving the state, and the purchase or possession of guns or other dangerous weapons. The state's case is compelling with corroborating evidence consisting of the deceased children, injured victims, and eyewitnesses. They also have video capturing the collision from multiple angles before and after the incident, data from the vehicle tracking system called an EDR, or event data recorder which shows a previous collision moments prior to crashing into the pavilion. It also showed her vehicle traveling at 44.3 miles per hour with the brakes off and a throttle percentage of 96.6% at the point of impact. The data further revealed progressive acceleration with the gas pedal to the floor, according to investigator testimony. Finally, the blood alcohol level tested at 0.118, twice the legal limit. The legal term for this condition in Michigan is super drunk, which carries stiffer penalties if convicted. Deputies also testified to physical signs of intoxication, including bloodshot, watery eyes, loss of balance and concentration, and the smell of intoxicants. Mrs. Chittister also tested positive for the prescription drug, gabapentin. It is important to note the additive effects of mixing alcohol and gabapentin. Although non-narcotic, both substances elicit a sedating effect that causes extreme drowsiness, lethargy, loss of coordination, and confusion. The mixture also presents a high risk for respiratory depression, overdose, and death. Mrs. Chittister confessed to being the driver and consuming alcohol on the scene. The case for the defense has far more holes to fill and obstacles to overcome. But here we can speculate on some potential strategies that may be used by the defense. Namely, standing mute at the most recent circuit court arraignment. Standing mute is a defensive posture similar to pleading the fifth. It is also a stall tactic for a defendant to buy time until there is a better sense of whether potential jurors from the community may be more inclined to convict or be persuaded otherwise. In a criminal case with a high probability of conviction, it is prudent for a defendant to remain silent rather than plead guilty or innocent without it being held against them during trial. Secondly, Attorney Kolovos gives us a hint of one of those strategies at the district court arraignment, arguing that his client's medical conditions caused the accident. Therefore, she should not be held criminally responsible to the degree of murder and offered suggestions for a reduced charge, especially since there was no intent. He urged the court to consider the epileptic-type seizures in her legs that caused them to freeze, preventing her from hitting the brakes before crashing into the building. He later notified the court of her neuropathy condition during a subsequent hearing. Medical evidence shows certain types of neuropathy do cause seizures. However, Michigan law does require epileptic patients to certify their medical status through a physician proving that the condition is under control through treatment and symptoms that could be unsafe while operating have been under control at least six months to be eligible for a driver's license. Based on these arguments, we assume that medical professionals will be called to substantiate his theories, especially personal doctors, if possible. We also speculate that auto collision experts will be called to provide alternative interpretations of the accident to challenge EDR data. As it relates to the blood alcohol level, Kolovos has already called into question the validity of the results suggesting some form of sample contamination to no avail at the district court level. He concluded that the results were a false positive, which is a processing error evidenced by the clear and lucid communication Mrs. Chittister exhibited during her initial contact with police. He denied any physical signs of intoxication and claims the defendant was served a single glass of wine and a bowl of chili at a local tavern four hours before the incident. Most wines have a 12% alcohol concentration, and with the additive effects of gabapentin, depending on the dose, or potential abuse, could lead to severe intoxication. Lastly, the defense denied a prior history of drunk driving or other traffic violations despite driving for 50 years. 
Although this will likely fail to shield her from prosecution in a double homicide case, it may very well weigh heavily on the judge's decision during sentencing. Character witnesses will likely be called to testify on her behalf. Finally, a local news article with attorney Kolovos should be noted, where he states the intent to file a motion for change of venue, believing it is impossible for Mrs. Chidester to get a fair trial in her community. As well, he plans to have the blood evidence thrown out based on a purported testing error. According to the report, attorney Kolovos states that there is no plea deal on the table, and he does not anticipate there being one 